Hey boys and girls, welcome back to uh, Monroe Live. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about what we found on the Mach-E um, powertrain. The motor, the inverter, the uh, gearbox, or as Ford puts it, the transmission. We're going to talk a little bit about what we found and what it, how it relates to the ID4 um, and, the, uh, and the Tesla uh, Model Y, Model 3. I, uh, I will tell you right now, a little disclaimer, I'm not as excited about this uh, system as I am others because it's got extra parts and um, um, it's, it's not as refined or defined as what we were expecting. So let's start off with the uh, rotor. This has been taken apart. So um, what you're looking at, whoa. One thing I am impressed with is the, is the magnets. Okay, so this has been taken apart, um, and uh, what you can see here is the, is the skewed sections. See these four little sections here? That's what most people are doing now to uh, reduce noise, make it so that it's a quieter running machine. Some people are telling me that it also uh, acts as a, a little bit of a boost for the uh, energy that you can get out of, a, out of an electric motor, the power you can get out. I'm not 100% sure I'm buying in that, that right now, but, uh, but it's, um, it, it is kind of, um, it is kind of uh, something we, I guess, will look about or think about. This has got eight poles, um, so that means that there's eight sections here of, uh, of magnets, and um, I just broke one. Uh, so I'm going to show you this, and I'm going to make sure that it doesn't touch anything. I just broke one because I laid it down... Um, about six or eight inches away and that thing shot up and smashed into the wall of the of the rotor and smashed into a bunch of different pieces so when we start looking at uh, the the product um, there's uh, there's a couple of things that people have asked about um, where do you get that uh, where do you get those pictures from we call this green green cloth or uh, uh, magnet paper there's a whole bunch of names for it but in essence we lay this over the top of, um, I don't think this will bugger, I think we've already buggered this up. So let me just put this on here. We put this over the top of the, um, of the, the magnets and, and in essence it shows us the, the flux, the, uh, the radiance, if you like, of whatever the, uh, uh, the magnets look like. And if we put it on the sides, that's where we can see the defining lines associated with the aura that you're seeing around the flux, you can see it here uh, a little more dramatically. But in essence, um, this tells us a lot of what's going on inside the, uh, inside the uh, rotor, which is actually, which is, uh, actually what's making the, uh, the, product, uh, the product work. So now let's have a look at, uh, now let's have a look at um, how these things are being held together. So if we look at the edge here, we can see that there's these, um, these little tabs. Now, normally, uh, those tabs are actually not just a locating fix, uh, feature, but they, they actually hold the magnets in place as well. Like on the Tesla, they're barbed. You, you go in and it's like a fish hook. It doesn't come back out. On the, on the uh, Ford, uh, these are heavily, heavily glued. Uh, normally, uh, we pull out a few laminates and then uh, we can pull the magnets out. On this one, you can see the excessive amount of glue that's on here. So on the laminates, there's um, a lot of people that have talked about there's more parts in an ICE engine there is in an um, uh, electric motor. Well, there's 507 laminates here, okay? Uh, that's a lot. We have to be very careful of when we talk about how... Uh, electric motors and, um, and gasoline engines work and we should try and be as honest as we can so there's there's 507 of these little teeny tiny parts not to mention all the magnets and everything else that's inside of here so what I'd like to do is just say that these are simpler products to put together much simpler to put together than, uh, than a gas, uh, gas engine but as far as parts and whatnot, that sounds a lot like uh, a reporter came up with those numbers, not, a, not an engineer. So let me just wrap this up and, uh, and let's, move on to, let's move on to the, um, the stator. This is the part that's 
basically stay still. One thing I do like on here is the hairpin design. This is something that you can automate. It's not as, uh, it's, it doesn't look like the um, a wound design similar to Tesla. This is the wound design uh, that they use. That takes a lot longer and, um, and it's not as automated as what I can get out of this. I like this idea from an uh, from, uh, energy standpoint and I also like it from an automated system standpoint to put things together. The big problem though is um, uh, we start to look at wasted space. This is where, this is where Ford is holding things together. So uh, they've used uh, these long bolts. The bolts are nice. Um, as, uh, as some of you know, I throw rocks at bolts every once in a while. But this has got a full dog point, which means that there's no question it's going to, uh, it's going to not cross thread. It will never cross thread. You don't really need that second washer, but I guess they wanted to put one in just in case. So that's fine. Uh, but one of the things that we looked at was um, when you put this product into the housing, let's move over here a little bit. The very first thing that happens is we see this component that's stuck out of the top. So what happens is this goes in here like this. And these leads down below are attached to these leads, this will be in the, in the motor configuration. It'll be like that. So let's have a look at um, how the leads fit to the electric motor. So what you're seeing here is a, is a component, a separate component that uh, the folks at, uh, the folks at uh, well, other, other companies uh, don't, don't use. They, they like a straight connection from, uh, from the leads straight into the electric motor. So you'll see that these are the power leads that are coming from, uh, from the inverter. And, um, and you can see down here that um, down here is where you're going to be connecting to the electric motor. The, the question is, uh, why? Why did we do that? Why didn't we just make these leads go straight into here? What, what is the rationale or reason for this extra part and all this extra copper? That's, um, that's something that only the engineer would know. Uh, but for me, um, I, I know that the inverter is right on top here. Why don't I just take these leads, come out of the inverter, go straight through a hole here, come straight down, and then make my connection to the, uh, to the stator. Um, that's something uh, I think uh, is uh, strange. The other, the other strange thing is this is maybe the biggest um, housing we've seen, probably ever. Uh, there's a lot of reasons I'm sure that they had for that, but um, I can't think of one right now. The other thing that we found was strange was um, if we look way inside here, uh, way up in here, you'll see uh, a pipe. And that system, that's used to squirt gear oil used for cooling on top of the, um, oh, getting my exercise today, that's the squirt oil on top of this plastic ring right here. And that's what, that's kind of like what, um, what cools the electric motor. If we look at what the other boys have done, you can see that these, um, these large um, galleries here, um, that's for coolant and this is on the ID4. And then if we look at Tesla, now this one's been cut up, so I can't show you the right side, but this is the uh, coolant ring that Tesla uses, and basically it just fits on top, and then it squirts, and uh, the oil then goes through uh, the tracking along the outside edge of the electric motor. So these are kind of like a little more elegant, and they use, they use a lot less uh, material. Um, and I kind of am into weight reduction. As I mentioned before, if you wanna, if you wanna have long, long range, you don't just look at a bigger battery, you have to look at everything and everything basically when it comes to electric motors or electric vehicles is weight. So I, I wanna do a, a little bit of a detail on the, um, on the pump that comes out of the Mach-E and the filter. This is the filter here. Now, these are buried. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not accessible. They, uh, 
to get to this um, is, uh, is a teardown, a bit of a teardown of the electric motor. I don't know how or why you'd ever want to change this, but um, this filter, like I say, you're going to have to take an awful lot apart in order, to, uh, in order to get to it. Same thing with changing this oil filter. And then we have the, the, uh, the oil cooler. This cooler is um, uh, something, that, uh, something that, in essence, says, uh, I, need, I need cooler oil here than, uh, than everybody else. So um, this is quite a size, and um, we don't usually see these um, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the powertrain. So let's talk a little bit about the Tesla setup for the oil pump and the filters and stuff like that. First off, this, this oil filter is exposed. I can get at it, I can change it if and when I have to. Um, I really don't know why we would have to do it, but, but in essence, uh, we can get at it. Here's the pump uh, for the Tesla. And again, you can see that the wires are exposed. It's easy to get at. It can be replaced easily. It's not like the Ford where you're going to be taking the whole engine or the whole motor apart to, to try and access where the pump is. The one good thing that we found, we found a couple of good things on the VW, but one thing that we found with the VW was that they do not have an oil pump. Um, they figured out how to get around it. It's a, it's a fairly expensive component. So VW should be commended on, uh, on showing us how they can reduce weight and reduce cost by not having an oil pump inside of their, um, inside of their powertrain. Another thing that I guess we, uh, we don't understand why is um, this arrangement here. Um, this is called um, a parking pole. And if you have an automatic transmission or a nice vehicle, you'd have one of these. Uh, but on an electric vehicle, normally, you have electric brakes. Uh, so why wouldn't I just turn the brakes on? Why, why do I need this? Um, you look at all these components. They all add weight. They all add cost. They all are unnecessary. I don't, I don't get it. This, is, this should be like a couple of lines of code. Not a, code doesn't cost much. And, um, and it weighs nothing. So eliminating this would be a really good idea. And our friends over at Volkswagen, they eliminated it, and Tesla has eliminated it for a long time. So I don't understand this. I don't understand that. I think that uh, there's weight and cost reduction aplenty inside this, uh, inside this uh, vehicle. Then we move over here, and this is the, uh, this is the uh, transmission uh, for, this, uh, for this electric motor. Now. This looks a lot different than everybody else's. Um, one thing I like is that this transmission is in line so that um, there's no offset. And we mentioned this before, there's no offset uh, transmission. It's, it's in line, everything's great about that. This is using a planetary, um, a planetary transmission. And I have no complaints with that either because quite frank, it's a, it's, it's a fine system it weighs a little bit more, costs a little bit more, but it's much, much quieter. Um, this is what you find in a, a real transmission. So um, we haven't seen too many of um, too many of the other guys going into um, um, into this kind of a design uh, with uh, with sun gears and uh, and planetary gear system. Um, it probably it might um, add more weight or maybe a little more cost, but. I like the idea of getting rid of transmission noise, and this does do that. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop. We're going to turn the tables around and whatnot, and then we're going to talk about the inverter. Well, now we're going to move on to the inverter. And uh, <laughs> I, have to, I have to tell you, I need help with this one. So Ben's here, and we're going to put this thing together for you. And um, um, it, it is an interesting build. Is that? Uh, that's a nice way of saying it. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. So yeah. anyway, um, we're going to start off with this. Uh, this is the base part, right? The casting that we would normally expect to see. And I'm going to do half of this thing. <laughs> Ben's <laughs> going to do the other half. And most of the explaining. So here we have two standoffs, okay? Which I'm not quite sure I understand. 
Right. And those, then, are, those are parts that we thought could have been cast into the, uh, the original right. shape to give you the, yeah. the space that you need. And then we put this uh, fancy spring. So uh, I, I'm usually not against uh, uh, putting in uh, springs because this is going to have to have thermal expansion and whatnot. But I must say um, the jury's out on this one. So here we have the spring sitting in place. Now for the fun part. And this is why I can't put it together. So um, it's going to go in. So we have a cooling plate that goes in from the other side. And we'll push up. Ouch. Oh. Don't push so hard. <laughs> <coughs> OK, so let me uh, try this again. Is this it this way or that way? I can't tell. OK, good. So we push so up against those against springs. That. And then we have some fasteners from the outside of the cooling plate that go in. <clears throat> Only four though, right? Only four. We'll get a couple in here hand tight just to try and keep it in place. Come on, Ben, the camera's rolling here. I know. Jeez, time's a waste then. All right, so we put a couple of fasteners in there, hand tight. And this, when you, there's a lot of room to compress that spring right now. Uh, we're not going to drive these in all the way, but that'll keep constant force on this, so that when it does cool Spain off or heat up, it, yeah. it'll it'll keep it in the right position. And the reason for that is they're using silicon carbide MOSFETs inside of these. So these. Uh, these are used instead of IGBTs. They are a little bit more expensive right now, but you do get faster switching and they're more efficient mm -hmm. uh, than the IGBTs that are uh, prevalently used today. The cost of these are dropping pretty quickly, so we, sh we were expecting to see more of this style uh, coming in the future. So there, these will come in, be placed in. Uh, you can see each one of the slots gets one of these components. There's a thermal interface material that would hold this in place typically. It's going to fall out right now because it's not sticky enough for us to do it. But all of those get filled in. And then the front and end slot get this spacer slid in so that uh, it doesn't, as it expands and contrasts, it doesn't bend or warp any of the, any of the fins in this cooling plate. Right. The fins might uh, actually break if... Um if, uh, if we don't keep everything just as rigid as we possibly can. All right. All right. right. So and now then now comes the fun part. Now comes the fun part, and we start bringing in some pieces. Okay, this is so the. Let me, oh. um, let me just do one thing because we're going to do it sooner or later. Let me, let me just, uh, not that one, this one. Let me just bring this in so we can talk about it. And. You can show where things get welded. We will. All right. So as we bring parts in, the first part that's brought in is this bleed resistor. It is attached um, to this mounting bracket. Uh, there's just some other, other hardware that's on here for fastening to. So this comes in and will get mounted in, into here. It would get screwed into place. With these three here. Correct. And then we have a, another bus bar that will come in. And we'll mount on top of that. And then there are two fasteners that will hold it in place, as well as a connection there that will make some more, uh, put another piece on top of in just a second. And now for the big fun. And yeah, now for the big fun. We have a bus bar that will connect to the MOSFETs that are in here. And we have this in. The other way around, yeah, I saw that. Huh. Yep. There we Sorry. go. So we bring this in. It should be this one here. Why am I? There we go. It's that one there. I'm sorry. And we did have this the right way, Sandy. I'm sorry about that. You know, I knew that. Yeah, uh, we were going to. Right. Yeah, sure he did. There we go. So that gets in. There would be MOSFETs going all the way through there. And you can see uh, they are welded in place for each one of them. Uh, we've cut those welds to be able to take this apart. There, this is a common design 
with the IGBTs or the MOSFETs is to weld them in place. Uh, we have seen on one vehicle where it's snapped into place so that it, uh, it saves a whole lot of time during the assembly. You don't have to go back through and have a secondary operation to tack some welds on. Not only that, anytime you're welding, you're going to get dirt and spatter and things like that. And personally, I, I really, this is a total mystery as to why we're doing things like that. Especially seeing as most of the stuff we do in airplanes, it's push in. We don't, mm -hmm. we don't do this. So anyway, go ahead. All right. Next, they have a small insulator that will go in between here, as there is another bus bar that connects the MOSFETs. So, so, so what so you're doing is you're welding, and welding. then you're assembling. And one of the first rules of um, of assembly that Henry Ford came up with was. The people on the line shall never modify the product. There'll be no files, no hammers, no welding on an assembly area. And he did that so he could have cleanliness. So first I got to weld that one to the IGB, or sorry, the, to the MOSFETs. Then I got to weld this one, and guess what? Uh, then you go back and you put some screws in. So there's some more manual assembly. You bring in the uh, this is the bus bar for the high voltage side that will connect to the motor. And this is brought in. And guess what you do on this side? Again, once we get this down in here, what you do over here is another set of welds to get that one in position after it's screwed in place. So you're going manual assembly, welding, manual assembly, welding, manual assembly to welding again. So there's a lot of back and forth with this. Um, and then after you get all of this in here, welded down, screwed in place, there is a DC, uh, the uh, capacitor bank goes on top of this and gets screwed into place and connected to the bus bars. So this would complete half of the inverter. Now, now you do what you we're gonna really don't want to do in any assembly process. And that's invert. Is, so is, I'm yep, going to try flip and it pull over. this thing so I don't lose the MOSFETs again. Okay, that was simple. So now, after we've got that all done, now we do something that, again, I wrote the spec for this when I was at Ford. Now we're going to try and take this and we're going to try and flip it over the top of all of those little pins that you see there. Okay, um, I, 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 uh, I'm totally lost on this one because to me, even though I've got two pins that are gonna locate it, I see nothing but heartache and grief. Now those pins are gonna come through all these little dinky holes, hopefully, but I'm sure that maybe you've tried to, I don't know, put uh, put something together where you had to have two two posts that had to go into two holes right so you you're, you're assembling a lawn chair or something like that and you got to put this one here and this one here and they got to go in at the same time and they're bent like a u or whatever so they're rigid imagine what you got is one two three four five five times one two three four five six seven eight nine eighteen five times 18 little pins that you got to try and get in all at the same time. And then you get to go and solder these pins in place. So there's 90 pins that Sandy was just talking about that need to get soldered in after this is brought, put in place and fastened in place. And there are standoffs that they're using 17 standoffs that they're putting in here. Now these are the double. These plate. are double standoffs. So if you want to, here you go. Yeah. Sandy. So they clamp, and as you can see, these are not cheap. Uh, they've got uh, double washers. Um, they're plated, my guess, in stainless steel, or maybe they're made out of stainless steel. I'm not sure, but at the end of the day, these are definitely high class, high cost kinds of fasteners, and um, and I, I don't know why this thing is bolted down like this, but to me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Now, why do you think they picked 16? The reason is simple. There was not enough room to get 17 in. 
they couldn't figure out how to get that 17 screw in. So anyways, enough of the funsies. So, yep. so you, you get those, uh, the standoffs in, then they have a mounting plate for the upper circuit board that comes in. So this is a steel plate. That is, that is pretty thick. It. It's very, uh, very robust. strong, robust, yes, um, that comes in. We are thinking this may be for some EMI shielding in localized areas. Uh, can't come up with another reason that they need something that's aluminum and so big, but they do have areas where there isn't anything, so there could be some, some EMI noise still, still I getting around. I can't, um, I can't see how, because the whole casting is, is, is an EMI shield. This, this extra little uh, goop that they put on here, that probably has EMI protection on it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just totally mystified. And then we get to put these little teeny tiny screws in. Now, another thing from Ford Motor Company was if the R and the D aren't like the, this diameter and this length, it's uh, the, wrong, the wrong deal. When I'm hoping that this is gonna be automatically fed, but this will tumble. If I put it into my feeders, this will tumble. And this thing doesn't have a dog point on it either. So what you wind up with is if an operator tries to do this, especially if he's got fat hands like I do, it's a big, it's a bit of an issue. It'll slow them right down. But if you have a machine doing it, it's going to tumble in the tracks. It doesn't like automation, doesn't like anything that turns or could turn inside the, uh, the uh, feed tubes. So uh, it's a total mystery to me. And by the way, that's in one place, but they also the, go in this place it's here. The, it is the same screw for the next level as it yeah. was for this level. And right now we are putting so, these ones in down below, yeah. trying to hold the plate. So this is holding the plate to the standoff, which was to the, uh, the lower PC board. So I have another question that always comes up when I, I, I have something that's hard for somebody, somebody to hold on to. What happens if Charlie goes over, oops, oh, oh, that, that's, that might be bad. This one will get stuck and I can pick it up, but what happens if it's, oh, well, that's a problem, isn't it? So now what's below this? Oh yeah, high voltage. So at the end of the day, I don't like a lot of screws. I don't know why these aren't snapped in place. There's lots of people that snap uh, these, uh, these boards together. I don't even know what this is for. But I know one thing for sure. I know that if one of these comes in contact with one of those um, contactors down below, it could get it could get ugly. So I, I'm I'm uh, mystified. I I really am. I like I say, I was the guy who wrote the spec, the J spec. It's called uh, for feeding and orienting, and uh, and I don't get it. So anyways, um, let's go to the next one. All right, so then we have it. the upper board and we have again, pins that were coming from the lower board, some more holes that you've got to get lined up perfectly to bring into place. Uh, there is a little bit left from our guide pins on the side, but not a lot because we're up at the top of the, uh, of the housing. And then that would slide down in and into position. And again, solder all of those spots into place. Um, this is somewhere where we'd like to see a board-to-board -board connector where they just there's yeah. plastic housing around the pin and the receptacle on both sides and it guides it into place when you go to snap it together. Uh, there is a little bit more piece cost to that kind of, a, of an execution, but it gives you a lot better quality. When you're doing this, it's very easy to get one of these pins bent a little bit and then you can't line up the top board uh, and it, you have to take everything apart to take the bottom board off to replace it. Mm. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of opportunity for failure uh, with that type of a setup. And then again, you bring this into place, and what do we have to do some more of? We have more fasteners to go in. Another uh, 16 or 17 fasteners to hold this top board to the plate that was there. And then we get to, this is for the side cover. We'll try and spin this around so that you can see where this goes. We can hold a little bit of it together. You can see this is the bus bar that was coming off of the MOSFETs. If you could, Sandy, hand me the yeah. bus bar that's on top of the casting there. So this will sit, 
This would sit on top of the casting. We can't, or for the, this would sit on top of the motor housing. Since nothing's bolted in on the bottom, we can't really pick this up. But what this will do is you can bring this piece up and in, and then you can take the bus bar that's inside of this and connect it to the bus bar that goes down and into the motor. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then, as Sandy said earlier, if we would have just taken the original, the first three bus bars that come off of the MOSFET, spin it 90 degrees in this housing, so you come down on the front of this, this whole additional, let's uh, take it back out, this additional piece could have, oh, there we go. Okay, so <laughs> that's enough of that. Yeah, well, that's this piece could have been eliminated by moving these leads to the front of this and dropping it directly into the motor housing. And then we do have this cover that goes on the outside. Uh, once that all those connections are made, gets connected in. There is a, uh, a relay that's here. When you pull this, this will cut the high voltage. So as soon as you take this off, it cuts the high voltage power running to the motor. So you can't get at any of these bus bars with power running to them. And that's a good idea because um, there's always somebody that wants to try something out without any experience or exposure to how it's done. The last piece is uh, this one. Um, so I'll turn it around to give you the, um, the, the more difficult side. And the idea is trying to get this to fit in inside that little slot. And uh, we've all had our fair share of problems with it. But this is, uh, this is uh, at least they've got uh, uh, an RTV kind of sealant here. And um, so you put that on and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So why is it that a circuit board gets I 16, mean, 16 or 17? And this is only getting eight. I would feel dejected uh, if, if it was me and I, if I was that, that cover. I mean, I would say, well, wait a minute, shouldn't I have 16 screws as well? I'm sure that if these pieces of aluminum could cry, they would be. Anyway. Thanks very much for watching. Um, we'll be uh, <clears throat> we'll be showing you some more stuff on the um, on the Maki -E real soon. Um, um, and again, if anybody uh, if anybody at Ford wants to take any of these ideas and implement them to save the company a lot of money, uh, feel free. We uh, we're here to help. <laughs> we're here for you. Okay. So anyway, see you around. Thanks so much. Uh, COVID's coming back, so tip those uh, cashiers. See ya. Bye.